Good evening. I'm Sarah Herda, the director of the Graham Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for a talk by Moshe Softy titled Humanizing Megascale. Thank you for your patience. We had an overwhelming response to tonight's talk, so it took us a little bit of time to get everybody um, settled. This year marks 50 years since the completion of Softy's groundbreaking housing project, Habitat 67, created for the 1967 World Expo in Montreal. Tonight, Softy will reflect on this project and its many iterations, um, including the unfinished Habitat Puerto Rico project, which um, uh, we'll hear a little bit more about, and the impact that this seminal project has had on the trajectory of his thriving 50 plus years in practice. Tonight's talk is also held on the occasion of artist David Hart's new commission for the Graham Foundation in the forest. This multi-part installation revisits Softy's 68 unfinished Habitat Puerto Rico project and continues Hart's own investigation into the relationship between ideology, architecture, and the environment. And we had a great few moments to sort of get these two together for the first time um, and talk about this project. This exhibition was also commissioned to coincide with the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial and will be on view until January 6th. After the talk tonight, um, Mr. Softy will um, take a few questions and then I invite you all downstairs for, um, to see the exhibition and to join a reception um, and continue the conversation. Moshe Softy is an architect, urban planner, educator, theorist, and author. Over a celebrated career that spans more than 50 years, Softy has explored the essential principles of socially responsible design with a distinct visual language. A citizen of Israel, Canada, and the United States, Softy graduated from McGill University in Montreal. After apprenticing with architect Louis Kahn in Philadelphia, where we also learned he became close to Ann Ting, someone who's close to our hearts here at the Graham Foundation, um, Softy returned to Montreal, established his own firm in 64, and realized Habitat 67, a key component to the master plan for the 67 World Exhibition. Author of four books and a frequent essayist, and lecturer, and teacher, Softy's global practice includes work in North and South America, the Middle East, and throughout Asia and Australia. Projects span a wide variety of typologies, including airports, museums, performing arts centers, libraries, housing, mixed use, and entire cities. His many honors include the Companion of the Order of Canada, the gold medal from both the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada and the American Institute of Architects, the Medal of Merit from the Order of Architects of Quebec, Canada, and Israel's Rector Prize. The Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum also awarded Mr. Softy the National Design Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2016. It is an honor to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Moshe Softy. Thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here, Chicago. Uh, for us, non not from Chicago, the city of architecture. Um, I want to share with you tonight a particular journey, um, a, a personal uh, sharing. Uh, actually, I would say it's sort of a particular strand or path in that journey. And it begins in 1959, um, at a moment in which I began to rethink the typology of high-rise housing. Um, and this evolved uh, to reconsidering the typology of high-rise towers generally, as I will uh, show, and questioning and dealing with the dominance of the high-rise tower as, as the dominant building block of, of contemporary urbanism. I'd also like to reflect on the public realm as an outcome of what has uh, evolved uh, by the deployment of high-rise buildings in dense urban environments. And of course, the context of it all is extraordinary densification of our cities extraordinary transformation into mega cities across the globe of tens of millions of people, uh, mostly living in high-rise buildings with problems of congestion and, and, and quality of life affected by density 
that I think obviously are without precedent uh, ever before. So we'll go back, 1959. Um, I was a student at McGill, and we had the, I had the good fortune to get a scholarship which was given to one student from every school of architecture in Canada to study housing across North America. And we took off. Uh, and basically what we visited were suburbs, and this was Levittown at the time, and we reflected that this was the kind of realization uh, of Ebenezer Howard's Garden City, uh, manifested in, uh, in the suburbs of America. And then we visited urban housing, and again, in terms of the precedence, there was the modernist Ville Radiers of Le Corbusier, there was Hilversheimer's ideal city of 1927. And what we visited was, again, the kind of post-war realization of these diagrams, public housing everywhere. Uh, this was Montreal. We came to Chicago. Uh, Cabrini Green. Uh, we, had, we went for relief to Robbie House and uh, <laughs> Unity <laughs> Temple. Um, and I came back determined uh, that for my thesis at McGill, I will try and rethink the typology of high-rise apartment buildings. Um, what disturbed us, me personally, but also us as students, was that at that point, the prevailing typology not being done by government bureaucracies, but by the kind of leading icons of the profession, was uh, Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation, and uh, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, Mies van der Rohe's many apartment towers in Montreal, in Toronto, and in Chicago, which we visited, in Detroit. And to, to me, it seemed that they had succumbed to the notion of the undifferentiated tower subdivided into some repetitive units, and completely turning their back on the centuries of vernacular traditions of housing. And I always felt that this cartoon somehow summed it up, that we were giving up 19th century urbanism for this new kind of urban prototype, and yet we still, a uh, hundred years later, are looking for a way to deploy that in a way that makes cities rather than just individual complexes. So, um, cut a long story short, that thesis became proposed as Habitat 67 for the World's Fair. Uh, it happened as I was working on the master plan. I had permission to develop my thesis as a proposal for the exhibition. And the government uh, eventually approved this for construction. Uh, it was prefabricated. The Fundamental idea was prefabrication for economy, factory construction, and the motto was for everyone a garden, and the idea was let the quality of life for everyone in, in housing be that of a house. Open streets, houses with gardens, multiple orientations, uh, people won't go to the suburbs because they could get this in the city and will live happily ever after. And here is the building 50 years later. It's, uh, it's doing, it's alive and well. It's a very cohesive community. It's gentrified. It's actually a very desirable place to be in. Um, it's got the patina of 50 years of life in it. Uh, and yet, I guess today I'd like to say that the day this was approved, I went up with the ex World's Fair management to present the project to the federal cabinet. I was 24, cocky young man. And uh, when they approved only a piece of it, I was deeply disappointed. And I'm going to reflect back today, uh, because I've not done that uh, for a while, that um, what they had approved was to build this out of that complex. And 
Partially that was because there was not time, and partially because I wanted to limit the risk, uh, which was considerable given I'd never built a building before. <laughs> but the ideas of the original proposal had much more than the complex that was built. And so now I reflect, 50 years later, if Habitat as built had the impact that it did, and I think I could say, uh, well, all, all due modestly, that it did, uh, if that whole complex would have been realized, 25 story high, truly a three-dimensional kind of structure in the sense that circulation prevailed at various levels, the uh, complex, these rhomboids, which all face the same uh, south-facing, uh, north-south and uh, no, uh, southwest and southeast orientation created this major public space under which had schools in them, offices, all kinds of community activities. You could see here in the cross section the kind of clustering of the houses and the kind of uh, uh, urban like complex which actually did address the public realm. And these diagrams of the day which I made to show how individual buildings with ground circulation can then be rethought in terms of three-dimensional planning where circulation and, and, and various community facilities occur at different levels and all the benefits that would arise out of this kind of relationship. Well, it didn't get built and uh, the, the speculation remains. But there was, after Habitat, there was a whole series of commissions uh, for other habitats. It was a bit like Bilbao. Everybody wanted one right after. And um, this was a proposal I developed for New York uh, on the East River in Lower Manhattan next to South Seaport. These uh, modules were suspended. They were prefabricated and suspended off major catenary cables. The density here was much greater than in Montreal. The, at the lower level, you could see mixed use of other urban activities uh, hovering over the river. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. And then we come to Puerto Rico, which David rediscovered many, uh, David Hart discovered many years later, where we worked with the Department of Housing uh, with HUD uh, under the program Breakthrough of the, of, uh, the US government. Uh, destined to bring new ideas and technologies into housing. The federal government uh, wouldn't happen today. Uh, and here we proposed uh, lightweight modules, much smaller. Uh, they, this is on a hillside. You see here the detailing of the clusters, trying to respond to the tropical climate. Much smaller units. This was. Uh, uh, public subsidized, subsidized public housing, the cross section as it climbed up the hill. And uh, these were out of our own archive showing the boxes being made in the temporary factory. Um, the factory as we conceived it where the modules would be produced uh, once the whole production was at full scale. The cranes, the boxes were light enough uh, so that they could be uh, lifted by a conventional crane. Uh, in other words, trying to resolve all the issues that we had in Montreal, we went from 70 tons to 25 tons. And you see here the hillside where the foundations are waiting. And I thought, what beautiful foundations. It's going to be fantastic, except that, that at that point, Project Breakthrough was canceled by the Nixon administration. Uh, government shouldn't be involved in housing. Uh, and there we were. And then there was Jerusalem, and I won't go into the details, and so on and so forth. So then there was a, a side trip where for many years I was doing public institutions, mostly museums, libraries, because it seemed that there was no chance at housing would uh, urban housing would get any, uh, any way, uh, could go forward anywhere in the United States. 
But, uh, and now I want to sort of also uh, bring it back to contemporary context. The densities I thought about in 1967 as being issues were a little fraction of what actually happened historically. What happened historically, which I think we could not have imagined in the 60s and 70s, were the kind of densities that evolved in Asian cities uh, where the land coverage is almost absolute. And this is, this is a, a, an earlier Hong Kong version. This is contemporary. And this is not public housing. This is uh, middle income and up housing. Uh, and I took this photograph in Sao Paulo, Brazil, because it, it, it showed how the uh, typology of three-story buildings with the red tile roofs is kind of getting displaced without any kind of plan by high-rise towers that are sort of like eating into the flesh and taking over. And within two or three years, all of that is just packed high-rise without any of the relief of the low-rise buildings in between. About uh, uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, as we were getting more and more involved in Asian projects, uh, I decided to initiate a, a, a research uh, fellowship in our office in which we would revisit Habitat. And we would revisit it on the basis of have there been changes in the building technology, how we would, we would address both the issue of density and mixed use that have become so prevalent today, and what kind of concepts could we come to address the economic issues that surrounded habitat. And I, the prevailing uh, assumption was habitat essentially did not prevail uh, because uh, its construction and complexity made it not affordable by uh, the great majority of the population. There were also particular problems with prefabrication as we conceived it. And, uh, the main problem being trying to create a module, a space cell, and ship it around has not proven to be feasible. In part because we're still stuck with heavy materials, in, fact, in part because transportation, urban transportation, just doesn't allow the flexibility of access. So new forms of prefabrication and industrialization need to be thought through. But this photograph shows you all the models we did in the course of one year as we were kind of exploring many, many different options. And this is just a little summary. We ended up selecting four paths or four schemes, uh, um, some denser than others, some simpler for construction, like the one on the top left being uh, vertical slab construction, very simple. Uh, no, uh, no structural complexity. But one study focused on New York specifically uh, in terms of mapping the density uh, and, and mixed use uh, um, pattern of central, of midtown Manhattan. Uh, and then taking that, those numbers, this is being uh, midtown Manhattan Red is office and blue is residential uh, and yellow is retail and producing the identical density and mix in a complex which you see here layered in three layers, 75 stories high, the lower layers being primarily offices and the upper layers being primarily residential with a community street at the 25th level uh, the kind of public realm development at grade. And you see here the uh, assembly of the parts. One of the objectives was, was to create great urban windows through the fabric so that it does not form walls. Whether you build it next to the river or to the park, it doesn't form uh, uh, barriers. And most of the housing have outdoor spaces, uh, terraces, and you see uh, generous community spaces at the various levels and roofs. 
And it was that project that spun off a number of, of other real life projects where we re started beginning to realize these concepts today in various Asian cities. This is Qing Wandao in China, uh, a coastal city uh, near Beijing. Um, an interesting thing about Qing Wandao is that they have a zoning requirement that says that every house or apartment, rather, uh, must receive two hours of sunlight measured in the winter solstice. Took us six months to figure out uh, how to achieve that at that density. And of course, the denser you go, the, uh, the, uh, the tougher it gets to, to satisfy. Um, you've got the same generosity of public spaces, uh, bridging between the masses and the terracing at the ends. This is just as it was nearing construction. Now it's kind of green and alive. Uh, you see it here uh, recently already being lived in. And this is middle income housing. So what we're, what we're finding is that we are able to achieve not quite, it's not habitat, but the quality of life, the kind of breaking up of the mass, the fractalization of the surface into outdoor terraces, etc. And this was followed up by a project in Singapore, which is also middle income housing, um, 600 units in the suburbs of Singapore, with uh, a series of bridges that weave through the project, which are communal spaces, and a combination of balconies and terraces giving outdoor spaces. And this is fully uh, um, lived in at this point, mostly by families and mostly with children which is fascinating because what you see in the life of a building is how high-rise adapts to families. I don't think in Montreal we ever, we ever tested that truly in the, same, in the sense that the density of children in Montreal was, was modest. I mean, here you have truly families with lots of kids uh, using and occupying all these spaces which are provided for communal life and the habitual roof swimming pool. I'm going to shift a little bit to the question of the public realm. And actually, before I get to the issue of achieving it in the urban context, in the, high, in the dense urban context, I wanted to just explore it at the scale of two individual institutional projects, a, a, a library, and, and a communal museum, uh, because it seems to me that it's at the level, the subtle level of detail that we determine whether a building to start with is part of the public realm and contributes to the public realm, uh, or, or whether it is turning its back on the public realm and not contributing to it as it might otherwise do. And in Salt Lake, uh, this is a public library, downtown Salt Lake, next to City Hall, which you see here. Um, it began with a competition, as many projects do. And this was the master plan, which um, was provided for the competition developed by the city planning of, uh, of Salt Lake. The blocks are 600 feet across in Salt Lake and the road's wide enough for a carriage to turn around, so there are, I think, six lanes wide each. Um, and the proposal was that the library uh, would have a public piazza. Uh, they also proposed that they'd be housing on the same block. That's the old library, and the library would have a public piazza in the middle of the block because they didn't feel they could achieve any public life along these wide, deserted streets. And Salt Lake downtown is not Chicago downtown or New York downtown. It is, it, it is deserted uh, as, as by sunset. Um, so one of the questions that, that I thought was, what, what does it mean to try and create a public piazza in a building uh, in the center of a block? Uh, what, what is it going to take? What catalyst will it take to? generate public life. And eventually, there was 
a diagram evolved. One of the things we talked about, and they, they mentioned as well in the program, is in addition to that piazza, there should be an urban room, a public space which is open 24 hours a day, uh, which people could come to indoors as well. Um, and that would be a place of the community independent of the control zone of the library where you enter and you go through security and so on and so forth. So we combined the idea of an urban room, which I'll show in a moment, with the idea of a, of a large public place of activity, as well as the roof being a reading garden, connecting the roof through this crescent wall so you could, from the outside, climb up to the roof, even if you're not going to the library. And uh, the combination of these, we felt, might actually uh, work. And you see here in plan that where the library proper is within this zone, you flow from the street and the public transportation, and you come into this urban room that then flows to the outside, and indoor, outdoor life, air conditioned and, and non-air conditioned, is sort of one continuum, lined with shops, cafes, auditoria, cinemas, uh, movie house, and so on and so forth, with the old library becoming also a public facility. So that, we felt, would, uh, would start perhaps working. And then the question was, this is the building as realized, uh, prove to us that people are going to, going to climb up this wall. I mean, what's, give us a precedent. So I had just come <laughs> back from China and we had the precedent. The reading garden and the urban room. And the urban room actually has been the place of extraordinary life and activity, uh, exhibitions, receptions, and you could be in your reading carol looking down on it. Uh, we, this is below the children's library, which extends to the outdoors, uh, as we see it from above. And the transparency and kind of exposed life within the building seen from around the building. But this transition of indoor-outdoor public, public spaces has actually generated all kinds of activities, as you see here. Uh, there are fairs, there are concerts. Uh, you can see that the whole thing has become a setting for public life. And fascinating in terms of its role in, in Salt Lake, being having the Mormon temple next door, and actually the non-Mormon part saying, now we have our own temple. Uh, but we did make it to Archie, uh, and they're not going bowling anymore, and then it goes on and it says, oh, it's awesome, wow, and double wow, throw a triple wow for me. <laughs> so what else would an architect want? <laughs> and in great contrast, and totally unurban place, but again in terms of the public realm, the uh, Crystal Bridges Museum, which was conceived to be a place of community as well as a museum. Um, the, site, the site is a uh, walking distance from downtown Bentonville, uh, through trails and through the valley here. Don't be, don't let your fantasies get too excited about downtown Bentonville. Uh, it's a very suburban setting, as you would expect uh, in Arkansas. Uh, but uh, I decided to build not on top of the hill uh, with, where there's a beautiful vegetation, but actually, like the old mill towns of Arkansas, build in the valley, uh, right in the, in the water course. That raised the eyebrows of the Corps of Engineers who started talking about the floods. Um, uh, you see here the stream going through the, the ravine. Uh, there's a spring there, which is Crystal Spring. Uh, but that innocent ravine can get fierce when the rains come. Uh, and the idea was to build two dams which would hold the water into two ponds and build around them 
a public place which then extends into trails and into paths and so on, which you see here and in its realized form. Um, the structures are wood, uh, local wood uh, and concrete. They all surround the ponds as the water flows right through. Uh, we ended up settling for the 3,000 year flood uh, with the Corps of Engineers, which I guess is maybe the big flood, I don't know. Uh, we've had some, here you see the dam uh, and the structures that span over it are literally suspension structures. So there's a kind of the platform and the bridging structures above, uh, suspended by the cables. And so you move through, you descend into the courtyard, uh, many public spaces, um, and you wander through. But it's really about the, the extension of the building into the, into the town, into the trails, so that it becomes something which is experienced um, as part of nature and the whole motto of the place was experience art in nature and the community has responded. So we come back to the city. This, this is a typical mixed use Asian project but it's not exclusive to Asia, it could be anywhere in the world. Uh, it consists of a large property assembled by a developer. It has three or four towers, usually office, residential, and hotel. And it sits over a podium totally introvert onto itself of retail. And this is the typology that today dominates most development, in, certainly in Asian cities, um, mostly in Latin American cities. Uh, this is, I, I mentioned before that I don't think we have yet learned, come to understand how to deploy towers to create urban realm. This is a project in Milan. It's done, I'm not going to mention names, but by very eminent colleagues, each doing a piece of it. They were supposed to get together and bring it together so that it creates a powerful urban place. But at the end, it's a collection it's a collection of sculptural buildings. Uh, and without passing judgment on the individual parts, it doesn't succeed in coalescing into anything more than that. So one of the things I've been kind of uh, uh, obsessed with is can one crack that, that dilemma uh, given the same kind of program? And I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of projects. Um, in which the public realm was the primary agenda. Uh, the first is Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. At face value, the assignment was to create a tourist-oriented, very high-density complex with convention centers and lots of shopping and theaters and museums and hotels um, and casino, of course. Um, and this was a tricky competition because it was the leading developers who are in this business in the world, each with their own architect, all singing to the tune of guidelines created by the government of Singapore, which said we want a place to extend the pub, they didn't use the word public realm, but to extend the facilities so that both the visitors to Singapore and the people of Singapore could use together and interact with. Uh, so we came into the picture during that competition and uh, one, this is kind of, okay, I'll go forward and then go back. Uh, one of the requirements, the site is landfill facing the bay, you'll see that in a moment. One of the requirements was to create a, a lively promenade along the water. Uh, which extends around the entire uh, bay and which the Urban Redevelopment Authority wanted to create as one continuum that weaves together all the projects to each other. Our program included the typical mall 
And I decided to take that mall and integrate it with the outdoor space by making them one kind of space integrated side by side so that by definition, what's an introvert mall becomes part of the city. And so that translates, and I go back to that. This, was, this is the Madaba plan of, of Byzantine Jerusalem where you've got the Cardo Maximus running through the city like all Roman cities from gate to gate and all the public buildings then coalesce along it. Uh, and in that sense, this was kind of creating a Cardo Maximus in that complex, which has its outdoor face and uh, outdoor life. And then it moves to the indoor and the air condition and multi levels of shopping. But they're back and forth and people can migrate with all the activities that go on, both indoors and outdoors, becoming one big public uh, space. And every other public space in the building became then open 24 hours to the public. So even the uh, hotel spaces and so on uh, form this kind of continuum. And one of the, I think, reasons we, uh, we won this in terms of the Singapore evaluation of the project was the notion that we could create a major public space uh, as a par almost major park on the roof of the whole complex. And this goes back to Habitat where I felt you can create public spaces in various levels of a development and the potential of doing so within the structure above is, is fantastic. So here we have parks and jogging uh, courses and observatory and swimming pools, both serving the project itself and uh, the city at large uh, come together. The Sky Park, it's got the world's longest swimming pool and it's not as dangerous as it looks. <laughs> There's a basket that catches you. <laughs> and one of the requirements was a major, quote, iconic public building uh, on the promontory. We decided to uh, provide Singapore that seems to have everything already, museums and aquariums and all that, with the Museum of Art Science. And that is the Museum of Art Science, which is jutting out on the promontory. Uh, a more complex and difficult project followed in China, uh, in the city, in, in China's largest city, uh, the city of Chongqing. Uh, 33 million people. How many have, of you have heard of Chongqing? About four, and that's the city, five but that's, you worked on it, so that doesn't count. <laughs> well, just consider the fact, we're talking about probably the largest city in the world, and, and four people in Chicago have heard of it before. It's not a criticism of Chicago. It's uh, the dilemma of, uh, anyhow, so the, the, the site is this, peninsula where the city was founded. It's kind of the equivalent of lower Manhattan where, where the city began and then spread. This is the Yangtze River, brown, and the Jialing River, blue, literally that way. The water's brown, the water's blue, and you get this line. Um, and uh, that's a great public piazza, and abutting it right there is our project, which for the city, uh, fathers or the city government, uh, the city government was a, a very significant project because it sort of was to anchor the downtown in, in the place where the city was founded. And so the density was extraordinary, 10 million square feet. And uh, we, uh, we sort of, uh, you know, in China, if you present a project without symbolic connections, you, you don't have a chance. So there has to be a story. And so the story was this is the, the sailing uh, shipping center of 
inner China. This is where all the shipping went up and down the Yangtze. And so uh, the whole notion of this being the harbor of the sailboats became the kind of uh, part of the story. And the towers form like uh, the, the eight towers which form this project, residential, office, etc., form a kind of a, uh, a sailboat coming down the Yangtze. We have towers which are residential, uh, office, hotel. Uh, there's two million square feet of, uh, of retail and other public spaces. There's transportation, there's the uh, shipping, uh, the, the passenger shipping terminal, all integrated into this complex. So here we were working for a commercial developer and they're not neither adventurous uh, nor are they interested in public realm, what are you talking about? And uh, they've gener uh, traditionally done shopping centers which are totally introvert, and the more you have a difficult time finding your way out, the better. I mean, I'm not sure they'd express it that way, but that's basically the philosophy behind planning these complexes. So as a starter, we proposed that it's the city streets that come towards a project that would extend as pedestrian ways going through. So that uh, whatever commercial spaces are here would just be an extension of a city street system. The other proposal was that since the land was dropping all around, the perimeter being much lower than the city itself, four levels lower, we could have these streets descend towards the plaza as commercial streets, whereas the roof of the entire complex could become in its entirety a public park. So as you walk from town, you could go th to the park or you could go through the streets to the shops and then end up in another open public space. We also propose, so here you have the streets running through and as they go through, they become glazed and, and air conditioned. And this is a, a, a brutal climate and totally polluted city. So you've got to do it. But you, the street itself just goes right through, as you see, from end to end going from the city. Not unlike in Milan, the Victoria Emanuel Galleria goes from the pia one piazza to another piazza and is completely part of the movement of the city. And the residential towers ascend from this public park, which you see here, all the entire podium being public. And finally, given the climate, the Sky Park takes another uh, life here of a conservatory with all kinds of public and private spaces sort of hovering over the city. Um, as you see here, with various levels and gardens and, and observatories and so on. Here it is under construction, uh, a year away from completion. And finally, there is a project in an airport in which one is trying to create a public place open to the city at large. That's uh, Singapore airport. Uh, a center that they conceived of as being for the city as well as for the passengers and the tens of thousands of people who work in the airport. And the program was quite simple. It said, we want a public place. Uh, it has to have shops, obviously. Uh, it's gotta have extension of the airport facilities, uh, but it has to have something that'll draw people. So this also was a competition. So one, team proposed uh, Dinosaur Park. Uh, another made a deal with Universal to do a kind of a theme park. Um, and we succeeded in convincing our, the, the developer who, who brought us in that you need to do something that's not gonna get dated. Let's just do the most wonderful garden uh, which people could come to and be full of wonders. And so this was a, a, a kind of an attempt to show you could do a commercial project and kind of create a, a 
uh, unison with, with the experience of nature. And that's in a city that has a lot going for it in, in the way of parks and greenery. And so you have here several levels of shopping that wrap around. You see here the kind of light bringing in into the shopping. You have airport facilities, you got parking, and hovering all over is a, is a, is a garden, a park, with levels that have attractions for young people, and, uh, and, uh, and tree and trails, and the entire structure is roofed with this dome which drains into the center. So on a good rainfall, you get 20,000 gallons a minute coming down this 40 meter high, 40 meter, 120 feet high waterfall. Uh, you see here the organization of the building. And it is uh, nearing completion. What you see here is exactly how it's being realized in terms of trees and the scale of trees and so on. Um, the Exploratorium in San Francisco has developed a whole series of exhibits or experiences for young people to interact scientifically uh, with, uh, within the garden with mazes and, uh, and other kind of mathematical-like and scientific-like installations. And there is the shopping, except it's never visible from the park. It's like two different worlds cohabiting with just glimpses through the moments where the two connect and the trains which connect the terminals run right through. And here it is as you approach the airport and under construction. So I'd like to say a couple of things in conclusion, sort of going back to, to a much more general sort of overlook. I'm often asked what makes you, what inspires you the most as an architect? And I think this is a, a, a journalistic question. And the expectation is that you'll recite all the buildings that uh, inspired you. And I found myself answering, uh, I find myself always answering, what inspires me the most is, is really understanding and studying how nature designs and understanding the process by which fitness is achieved through evolution, through natural selection. This is the, the, an x-ray through the wing of a, of a, of a dove. dove. Uh, and it shows the extraordinarily intricate lattice of the bone in the wing, which achieves maximum strength with minimum weight. And to me, it's just extraordinarily exquisite. And it has, it's just the evolution of an efficient structure. Uh, you know, we all know the sort of geometric forms, nautilus shell, which is uh, 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 it's, it's the outcome of its growth pattern. Or for that matter, the kind of transformation plant life goes through seasonally. And so we see it and we live with it, but it's, you've got shed, shedding its leaf at winter and transforming completely at summer. And just think of architecture uh, transforming itself seasonally in such a wonderful way where outdoor spaces are exposed to sun and light and then when the weather doesn't permit they sort of shield and shelter themselves and just kind of a convertible architecture, convertible public spaces, public piazzas. I mean, do we need to choose between air conditioning or being outdoors? We could probably achieve a transformation and all of that is hinting both at new methods and new materials uh, and new ways of thinking, uh, not in the sort of uh, caricature like green architecture, which has sort of become the sales flag of any architecture presentation, but truly trying to understand how nature adapts spaces uh, to its program. Um, and it is this kind of fitness uh, to purpose uh, manifested in the building processes, 
in the formal response to program um, and um, in formal responses to the cultural context that I think is how architecture might evolve out of its highly formalistic and arbitrary path that it is in today. Thank you very much. Hi, um, pleasure to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Uh, very lucky to have lived in Habitat 67 in the 90s for two years. So I've been waiting about 20 years to ask you this question, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, there seems to have been a distinction between perhaps the design for the World's Fair for, Hab for Expo 67 and then the use of Habitat 67 after the World's Fair. Um, just as a resident, for example, there was no bus service there. Um, and there was a shuttle that went to the city, but if you missed the last one at seven, as a teenager, I was screwed. <laughs> uh, there was a dep in the, in the bottom floor, a corner store, but there was no grocery stores. Um, so it was kind of isolated. And I'm, I always have been curious, was that by design for the World's Fair, or was it something that factored into your thoughts for life after the World's Fair? It, it, it's, it's a question that is like putting salt in a wound, but... <laughs> <laughs> so let's go, let's go, first of all, to the beginning. In the beginning, as we were developing the master plan, the mayor had proposed creating three islands in the middle of the river uh, and having the fair there. And we, the planners, uh, uh, felt I mean, three or four of us, that it wasn't a big organization. Uh, and, and my thesis advisor, who was my mentor, who was involved with us, felt that if that happens, then after Expo, there'll be nothing left in terms of the city's connection to the river, because the whole riverfront was industrial at the time, and the site of Habitat was part of the harbor. So the idea was if you put part of the World Fair on the mainland, so to speak, it'll anchor that move and the city will be committed to the river front. And therefore, all the buildings to be built for Expo that were permanent, habitat, uh, headquarters building, etc., they ought to go on that land and the pavilions will go to the islands. So this was the ambition this would be a living part and extension of downtown. They built a train for Expo, it would stay, and you'd, you'd just jump on the train and be downtown, because they had built a train for Expo. The tracks were removed. So then comes my proposal, which was 1,200 units, as I showed, which would have meant bus service, would have meant the school right there, would have meant shopping, because 1,200 families is a critical mass to do that. And the government builds a little piece. And I say to them, it's going to be all isolated. Nobody's going to be able to go to school and all that. And they said, well, more will come later. Five years forward, the Olympics come. So I go to see the mayor. Um, and I say to him, look, why are you trying to put the Olympic Village in the east end of the city? Put the stadium on the islands. and." put the Olympic Village next to Habitat, and we'll live happily ever after. We'll have all the population, that will stay, and the whole area would be fully developed. But politically at the time, he felt that French dominance of the city can be preserved only in the East. He didn't realize that they've taken over the city. It was a one war already. So that was the next disappointment. And then they, instead of really developing, uh, making a, an exciting urban development plan and going out to developers and building the rest of it next to Habitat, they let the, the land just sits there with two little apartment buildings. And so it is isolated. This is, uh, that's why I say it's a little painful, but 
wasn't intended to be. I wonder if you can share some your personal thoughts on the differences in tor attitudes towards public space in Canada and the U.S. as you experienced it through your own work in both countries. I think the differences are major. Uh, I mean, lately they've become very major as we have our successive elections, and but that's another story uh, for another evening. Uh, I think that the differences are both in the way public buildings are built in Canada versus the United States. By public buildings, I mean libraries, museums, particularly institutional cultural buildings, and in the planning traditions. Um, and now, in Canada, it's shifted from the federal government to the, to the provinces. It's mostly provincial jurisdiction, but there is a tradition of planning in Vancouver, by planning, I mean uh, not, let's say, fair planning, but I mean proactive planning, which in the United States existed in the Lindsay days in New York and in Chicago in its days, and, but has dissipated. I mean, you know, most planning urban development authorities and all that, I've, I mean, Boston, BRA has become just, you know, it facilitates development. That's what it does. It, so Canada still has some confidence that planning can yield some results, whereas we are coming out of 25 years of the market knows best. I thought it's shifting for a while, but certainly the current federal government is shifting it back. So um, has, is Canada as far as Singapore? No way. I mean, Singapore is light years ahead of anything in North America in terms of the role of planning and shaping the city. Down there. Mr. Safi, uh, I worked at Expo and I met you 50 years ago. <laughs> we both, uh, you have white hair and I have no hair. <laughs> you have white hair and I have no hair. <laughs> I met you at Happy Tat at a party uh, in 67, and you told me, I never forgot it, you said that maybe you built the walls too thick at Habitat, that they were unnecessarily too, too thick to hold the building up. Did you consider that later on and make them thinner, or do you remember We that? did, we did. In fact, uh, when we went to Puerto Rico, we had developed the modules to be three inches thick, rather than five, as in Montreal, and we cut the weight substantially. Uh, and I think that one could go for a lighter box, Yet, let me qualify something. I had hoped uh, then, as I do now, that materials will emerge which are fireproof, therefore usable in tall buildings, which are lighter than concrete and able to support structure and, and be fireproof and insulating and all that. It hasn't happened. Concrete is still, steel and concrete are still the only practical high-rise construction materials. I mean, I've seen some experimentations with wood, but wood is neither lighter uh, than, than these materials. So we basically have not cracked that problem in terms of bringing to the construction industry the materials that, say, the aircraft industry enjoys or some, or some of the other manufacturing. And so the real lightness uh, is yet to come. Last question. I'm wondering how um, the evolution of the internet and of um, its effect on people and sort of isolating them overlays uh, to your ideas of getting people together and having them interact and creating these sort of humane uh, urban centers. Um, and perhaps how is this something that architects can address, or is it beyond the ability of architects to address that? I think architects address it, but they're also uh, the recipients of, of what evolves. In other words, you can't, you can't, you can't deny those forces uh, because if you, whether you like them or not. So let, let, let me explain. 
it used to be like at the beginning of computation and internet that people said nobody will need to travel to work. The days of congestion are over because everybody will work at home. At the time I said, I don't believe it for one minute because there's no replacement for face to face. There'll be some of it. You know, we have so-called Webex uh, go to meeting on the internet in our office. Uh, unfortunately, every night because we do it with Asia, their morning is our evening. So we do communicate, but that's not replacement for face to face. So the said convention centers, obsolete because people won't need it anymore. There's internet. None of that has happened. Um, however, there is one thing that's happening right in front of our nose, which is the impact on retail of online shopping. Uh, so it's, you hear that retail is dying. And that means less people go out shopping. Therefore, urban centers are, are, are going to be deeply affected. I think some of it is true. People are going to do more shopping online. They do already. But I think that the, the desire and the reason for interacting will not, uh, will not uh, have that impact because essentially people have more leisure time and they are looking for what to do with it. And, and, and they also, even if they are not, even if you're shopping online, going out there and seeing what there is to buy and all that doesn't go away. So I think generally, uh, and, my, and I know that Nicholas Negroponte, my, uh, an old friend who's sort of on the other side, who believes that everything will change dramatically, won't agree with me. But I think fundamentally, I think the desire to congregate in, for work and pleasure and leisure in urban places will not diminish. That there is, just the emphasis will shift. Maybe less shopping, more entertainment, more leisure but it, it, it will not go away. I think the problem though is that we live in an age which is inclined to privatize it. It's easier to privatize it for maintenance. It's easier to privatize it because you can have those who contribute economically to making money uh, are brought in while those who don't are kept out. Uh, and you see that in the way malls are run and, and other public facilities. And I think that it's going to take a lot of regulation, regulatory stuff to keep these places really open to the public in sense of being part of the public realm. Because I think the private sector on its own will continue this trend towards privatization. And I think it's very bad for the city and for society. Thank you.